I think you have said, uh, in fact, and I'm going to quote, development of superhuman machine intelligence is probably the greatest threat to the continued existence of humanity. My worst fears are that we cause significant, we, the field, the technology, the industry, cause significant harm to the world. Uh, I think that could happen in a lot of different ways. It's why we started the company. Um, it's a big part of why I'm here today. I think if this technology goes wrong, it can go quite wrong. Uh, and we want to be vocal about that. We want to work with the government to prevent that from happening. But we, we try to be very clear-eyed about what the downside case is and the work that we have to do to mitigate that. Walt Disney was as driven a man as I've ever met in my life. Little did we know when we dreamed up Mickey and Donald here, that someday they would be the ancestors of the mammoth animated characters we've created for this fair. That's why I love Walt Disney. It cost $100,000 to build a spire you didn't need. Hey, listen, pal, I'm counting on you. <laughs> we'll do our best. He was so eager, he was so in love, so, believed so much in what he was going to present. Wherever his plane lands, people are there to greet him. Everybody loves him. Some of us get stuck in the present or the past, right. but he never did, did he? By the mid-20th century, Walter Elias Disney was widely revered as one of the greatest showmen in the world. His cartoon empire not only pushed boundaries in sound, music, and color, but his state-of-the-art theme park in Anaheim, California, Disneyland was one of a kind for its use of automated attractions and appeal to the inner child of young and old alike. In time, it sowed the seeds for an even more ambitious, higher-tech follow-up on the East Coast, the Florida Project. It's the most exciting and challenging assignment we've ever tackled at Walt Disney Productions. Disney was a futurist, and among his peers, a bigger advocate for technology could not be found. Yet, the secret to his success was never just his contraptions. If Walt Disney was going to change the world, he would need the people around him to do it. Especially after he was long gone. Such was the reaction everywhere to the news that the master of make-believe had died. His personality, his memory is so strong, the world goes on changing. Almost five years after his passing, in October 1971, the Florida Project opened its gates to the public as Walt Disney World, completing Walt's most daring dream and becoming the largest, most popular tourist destination on the planet. Though he was gone, and the spark of his genius along with him, Disney would forever leave his mark, inspiring generations of eager innovators with his dedication to imagination. Only two years later would one such innovator follow in Walt's footsteps, using cutting-edge automation and innovative technology to complete a dream of his own. A very particular dream of his own. Debuting 50 years ago this November, it was called Westworld. Sir, we have no control over the robots at all. Westworld was written and directed by Michael Crichton, a medical graduate turned novelist who broke into the film industry by adapting his books into films, starting with 1969's Andromeda Strain. For someone who would go on to write about the ethics of biological science and technology in books like Congo, The Terminal Man, and Sphere, Westworld was an oddity. The vision of a Disney World-inspired amusement park that was everything Disney was not. A destination for sex, adultery, and murder, carried out by a population of human-like androids, subservient to their guests' every desire. That is, until an android played by Yoel Brynner, the gunslinger, goes rogue and starts killing parkgoers. Westworld then descends into panic, while its control room operators struggle to maintain control. If we can't ensure the safety of the guests, we're going to be in desperate trouble. But we can ensure their safety. Everything's fine. What made Westworld so innovative 
behind the scenes that is, is for something that audiences probably wouldn't even blink an eye at today. The distinct, pixelated view of the gunslinger. Though the effect can be achieved today, and on this very video, in the press of a button, there was no precedent for it in 1973. There was only John Whitney Jr., the son of the renowned experimental filmmaker who made the computer animation in Vertigo. To start, Whitney divided every frame of the gunslinger's vision into small squares and calculated the average color of each square. He then used one of the few machines in Los Angeles capable of scanning film onto a computer and computer images onto film to perform several tests before processing the footage, which took roughly 8 hours per 10 second sequence. The final effect was disturbing and digital, capturing something audiences had never quite seen before. John Whitney Jr. wasn't the first computer graphics artist the world had ever seen, but he was one of the first to bring it to the world of film. And unbeknownst to him, he would be far, far from the last. For the filmmaking medium, and really the medium of every entertainer around the globe, was on the verge of something big. The biggest revolution in spectacle since the time of Walt Disney. And between all the novels, screenplays, and films he would create for the next two decades, Michael Crichton would never be too far from its forefront. It would soon be the age of the computer. was the age of make-believe, where exciting developments in cinematic special effects, largely pioneered by the George Lucas-owned Industrial Light and Magic, were pushing the boundaries of digital filmmaking faster than the Millennium Falcon. It's the ship that made the Kessel run in less than 12 parsecs. Computerized effects, like Whitney's image processing, were becoming increasingly essential to the craft of film, while films in themselves became increasingly dependent on new advancements in computers. 3D modeling, texture mapping, and hidden surface determination, pioneered by computer scientists like James Clark, the founder of Silicon Graphics, Fred Park, who animated the first 3D digital face, and Edwin Catmull, the co-founder of Pixar, who started his career inspired by Walt Disney's classic cartoons. The long-standing and sometimes expensive special effects of miniatures, stop-motion animation, and animatronics were not yet on their way out the door, but they were becoming old hat. In hand with the blockbuster, a new advent in Hollywood led by rock star director Steven Spielberg, where massive tentpole films ruled the summer box office, computers too were ruling Hollywood. Not just behind the camera, but in front of it too. Movies like Terminator and Robocop were box office hits, while films like Blade Runner, though not as popular, dialed directly into a deep, existential fear that spread like wildfire in the 1980s. That very age of computers. Fears that computers would replace us, take our jobs away, or enslave us. It sounds irrational today, but in the 80s, computer phobia represented a fear of the unknown. Nobody knew where computers were headed, save for the innovators at the very forefront, still pining for that something big. And with the help of his friend Steven Spielberg, who we met on the Universal Pictures lot while making The Andromeda Strain, Michael Crichton was about to make that something hatch. Jurassic Park, Crichton's latest novel, was first pitched to Spielberg as a book about dinosaurs and DNA. A Costa Rican theme park of real live dinosaurs, engineered to entertain the masses. It was quintessentially Crichton, weaving chilling biological science, cutting edge technology, and theme park satire across 464 thrilling pages. But to Spielberg, Jurassic Park was a story about, well, him. A story about the careers of every thrill seeker, whether they spent the better half of their career directing Hollywood blockbusters or building rides about those blockbusters. Hey, we were saving that. But today, I guarantee it. Even Jurassic Park owner John Hammond 
who Crichton wrote as a vain and greedy businessman, Spielberg saw as a gentle, dressed in white Richard Attenborough. Something of a Walt Disney-esque figure, in genuine awe, as much as his cohorts in the film industry were in awe of his own creations. While characters like the paleontologist Alan Grant represented the computer-phobic, salt-of-the-earth skeptics who outright opposed all the tech he was embracing in his films. I hate computers. Although Spielberg read Jurassic Park at the turn of a more personal stage of his career, where he'd be embarking on much smaller films than his signature big-budget adventures, Crichton's pitch and the opportunity to bring the almost mythical creatures of his childhood to life was too good to pass up. Imagine the mighty Brachiosaurus, the lumbering Triceratops, or the fearsome T-Rex, rendered by the best special effects wizards money could afford in the 1990s. Really spectacular, spared no expense. Thankfully for Spielberg, he knew exactly who those wizards were. Stan Winston, Michael Lantieri, Dennis Murin, and Phil Tippett, the undisputed titans of special effects in the 80s. Though these men had worked on Star Wars, Back to the Future, and Indiana Jones, no project, pretty much nothing, rivaled what Spielberg wanted for Jurassic Park. Three full-sized models of the T-Rex, Velociraptors, and Triceratops for close-ups and mediums, and 60-odd wide shots of dinosaurs breathing, running, and attacking. At the time, no one could imagine accomplishing Spielberg's wide shots without Phil Tippett's stop-motion miniatures. It's how the legendary Ray Harryhausen animated his dinosaurs, and though technology had made promising evolution since then, it hadn't evolved enough to animate living, breathing creatures without stop motion. You know, we did the Abyss, we did T2, but those are alien hard surfaces. They're not natural, organic, breathing, sweating, bleeding things. We haven't really done that successfully. I don't know. Dennis Murin's team of digital artists at Industrial Light and Magic would step in to add the motion blur needed to lend the dinosaur's movements a lifelike quality, but otherwise, Tippett's go motion effects and Winston's animatronic models would be the basis for Jurassic Park's dinosaurs. It would remain that way for many months, almost all the way to production in 1992. Until everything changed. In total secrecy, two animators at ILM, Steve Spaz Williams and Mark AZ DePay, digitally scanned, 3D built, and animated a walking T-Rex skeleton. It was interesting on its own, but not in a promising enough state to have any use to the film. So, you're enjoying them. Determined to transform Spaz and Depay's skeleton into the walking, breathing, flesh and blood dinosaur Jurassic Park special effects team long supposed just couldn't be done, ILM went to work. They 3D scanned a six scale model of Winston's T Rex, reconstructed it into a digital wireframe, painted its texture map four times, further animated its walk cycle, and lit the full, final model for a daylight background plate selected by Murin. Every opportunity to see anything wrong you were going to see in this test. We weren't trying to hide anything. Finally, after four months of work, ILM held a screening for Steven Spielberg, George Lucas, and producer Kathleen Kennedy at Skywalker Ranch in 1991. What they saw didn't just change Jurassic Park. It changed the world. All of us leapt to our feet. I mean, literally leapt to our feet. I had a kind of religious experience. And probably the greatest epiphany I've ever experienced in, in my own world of making movies. And then all of a sudden, bam. Oh my God, we're there. The thing worked. And just instantly, it's like everything worked. The animation worked, the design, the lighting worked, the cop worked. I, I, I knew that at that moment, I knew that visual effects would never be the same again. 
I'm not exaggerating when I say looking at that test was like the moment when sound came to movies. It was the end of an era. There was no question about it, and it was the beginning of a whole nother era. That was the moment that I suddenly saw that everything was going to change. Not just my movie was going to be a better movie, but the entire world was going to follow in the footsteps of what Dennis Murin and Phil Tippett and ILM were bringing to Jurassic Park. It was going to change everything for all of us and for audiences everywhere. And we were never going to go back. Welcome to Jurassic Park. On June 11, 1993, Steven Spielberg's Jurassic Park was unleashed upon the world, finally giving audiences a glimpse at the first living, breathing, digital creatures to ever share the screen with live actors. And most crucially, they didn't just see it, they believed it. Jurassic Park would go on to be a multi-million cultural phenomenon and change the course of movies forever. With computer graphics, or CGI, the visual effects industry now had a tool that was cheaper, immune to physical limitations, and at times more convincing than almost every other technique in the book. As far as anyone knew, its only limitation was what one could imagine. With Roland Emmerich's Godzilla, photogrammetry made its way to film, allowing artists to convert the features of 2D photos onto 3D models. With the Star Wars prequels, George Lucas, ILM, and VFX supervisor John Knoll combined performance art and technology for the first ever photoreal digital character performance. Soon after, Lucas ushered in the digital movie camera, digital theater projectors, and the final conversions of the digital revolution of film. And with the help of New Zealand-based Weta FX, Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings and King Kong films pushed performance capture technology where it had never been before, setting the stage for James Cameron ever the pioneer of innovation he was in the 80s and 90s to make 2009's Avatar, envisioning a completely digital, photorealistic world. We're gonna make a fortune with this place. In just a few decades, the visual effects industry exploded from a few hundred experts to tens of thousands of animators, compositors, and artists. Today, the VFX industry estimates somewhere between 31,000 to 117,000 workers across 582 VFX houses across the globe and accounts for as much as 60% of a blockbuster's budget. Spared no expense. In every way Crichton, Spielberg, and the wizards of the original Jurassic Park could have imagined, the VFX industry evolved into a digital Jurassic Park of its own, devoted to thrilling audiences with awesome spectacle beyond their wildest imaginations. Forever after, there would be no going back. And there'd be no slowing down either. Shocking news from Hollywood this weekend. Actor Paul Walker, who began acting as a child, then starring in the Fast and Furious films, dying in a car crash. Yeah, Paul Walker, one of the stars of the enormously popular Fast and Furious movies, dead in a car crash. A mangled mess on a road in Southern California, which claimed the life of actor Paul Walker. On November 30th, 2013, 
Paul Walker, lead actor of the Fast and Furious franchise, died in a car accident in Los Angeles. His untimely passing brought Furious 7, only a few months into production, to an unprecedented halt. No one was certain, even director James Wan, of not just how to complete the film without one of its lead actors, but if it should even be finished at all. Was it distasteful to push on in spite of Walker's death, and would it even make for a compelling film? After a few months, Wan's crew had their answers. Reaching out to Joe Lettieri, a CG technical director on the original Jurassic Park and now senior visual effects supervisor at Weta Digital, the production of Furious 7 was about to attempt the impossible. Bring Paul Walker back from the dead. To create a lifelike digital replica of Brian O'Connor for all the scenes he had yet to star in. If it was possible, it'd take every trick in Weta's book to do it. Repurposed pre-existing footage, on-set body doubles, and digital facial scans of Paul's brothers Cody and Caleb. Using all this material, Weta would not interpret what Paul would have done with the rest of his performance, but try to recreate exactly what he would have done. To the best of their ability, what Weta accomplished was nothing less than a miracle. Nearly 22 years after the first living, breathing digital creatures graced the silver screen, the first living, breathing digital human graced it again, before promptly saying goodbye. But as Dominic Toretto once said, it's never goodbye. Hard at work on the Star Wars spin-off Rogue One, ILM gleaned what their rival VFX studio Weta Digital had done with Furious 7 and thought they could do one better. And so, they did. We've heard word of rumors circulating through the city. Apparently, you've lost a rather talkative cargo pilot. Using performance capture and CGI, ILM recreated the likenesses of Peter Cushing and Carrie Fisher as both had appeared in their 1977 roles for Star Wars. It was, once again, another miraculous feat. But unlike Walker's digital face in Furious 7, the effect was not received with open arms. Not in the slightest. In the Huffington Post, The Guardian, and messages from across social media, the effect was decried as digital indignity, an eerie development in digital filmmaking. It was unconvincing and ghoulish, especially for recreating the face of an actor who had died not amidst production, but 12 years before it even began, before the idea of Rogue One was even conceived. John Knoll, another veteran of Jurassic Park's special effects team, pushed back claiming it was done for defendable story reasons, and that despite the implications of creating a photoreal face, he couldn't imagine an effect so expensive and labor-intensive would be done so casually in the future. But Noel was dead wrong. Because in late 2017, a Redditor by the username of Deepfakes, inspired by Rogue One, would do something even more unthinkable and every bit more deplorable. He swapped the faces of famous Hollywood actresses onto porn actresses, forever colliding the world of digital spectacle that Jurassic Park popularized with the world of artificial intelligence. Please! In 1956, computer scientist Herbert Simon, Alan Newell, and John Shaw presented Logic Theorist, a program built to answer one question, can a computer think? It was, of course, inspired by Alan Turing's famous Turing test proposed just six years earlier and was designed to prove a series of mathematical theorems. Proving 38 out of 52 theorems correct, Logic Theorist gave way to an all-new discipline of what American computer scientist John McCarthy would call artificial intelligence, defined as the science and engineering of making intelligent machines. Decades later, the discipline has only grown more vast and much more complicated, with different subfields and approaches all intent on teaching systems to think rationally. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. 
Although computer scientists unwittingly gave Hollywood the perfect villain for their computer-ran dystopias, the systems that AI researchers would teach to think were nothing more than tools. Biometric detection software, self-driving cars, photo recognition settings, and pretty much anything automated. By definition, all these inventions are narrow AI, programmed to do specific tasks. It even includes Amazon's Alexa, IBM's Watson, and yes, even iPhone Siri. Continue on Skyview Drive, then in 500 feet, take a left. Even still, AI has seldom maintained anything more than a modest presence in most people's lives. A deepfake's AI-assisted face swaps, a landmark innovation in generative AI, marked what might have been the first day that stopped. Uh, you can't do that. Can they do that? Using TensorFlow and Keras, two free programs used by students and AI researchers, deepfakes input images and videos of the actresses, his training data, into a machine learning algorithm in a process called deep learning where a neural network of interconnected nodes autonomously run computations on input training data. After enough training, the nodes are arranged to complete the task of swapping a face. Although the effect wasn't totally convincing, it was disturbing enough to incite real public panic. The fake porn violated the actress's image and consent, and it wasn't long before AI-assisted porn was banned from Reddit and other social media sites. But the technology didn't go away. It did the opposite. Practically overnight, the internet saw the rise of the deepfake, memorializing the now-banned Reddit user with AI-assisted face swaps over famous movie scenes and celebrities. I am Iron Man. In just a few weeks, the machine learning process was simplified into a free software called Fake App. It was easier than ever. Although the new wave of deepfakes were mostly harmless, the ethical and moral concerns the technology spawned were quite plain. What's stopping someone from committing digital impersonation? From hijacking a politician's likeness or spreading lies with fake app? Even if their band ensued, how much damage could they do before that happens? But how we move forward is gonna be the difference between whether we survive or whether we become some kind of fucked up dystopia. For all of Deepfake's faults, what he and the users who embraced his tech pointed out was very true. This software was free and was not at all dissimilar from pre-existing AI programs from larger companies who'd been indiscreetly experimenting with AI for years. And uh, uh, I kissed Jordan three times. As a user of the deepfake subreddit insisted before its deletion, this technology was always going to become a reality. Nothing could stop that. Nor would anyone stop it from becoming much, much worse. Despite John Knoll's claims about Rogue One's digital faces, ILM would continue to toy with de-aging CGI effects in a smattering of projects, notoriously in The Mandalorian where Mark Hamill's Luke Skywalker appeared in painfully digital fashion. Met with much of the same criticism they received for the digital faces of Rogue One, Lucasfilm took notice of a viral video by a YouTuber named Shamuk, who used machine learning software to deepfake Luke's face in The Mandalorian. Months later, ILM hired him, and in February 2022, used his skills to stick it to everyone, not yet convinced, through the book of Boba Fett. Size matters not. That looks great. That looks so freaking good. This was huge. As hundreds of comments would exclaim below Shamuk's original Mandalorian deepfake video, what he had helped ILM accomplish was unbelievably astounding. But in parts of the press and Twitter, disgust was more rampant than ever. Many pointed out that Luke's voice was not even Hamill's, but an AI-generated voice created with a program called Respeecher. Really? That's all you got? It would be used again to recreate the voice of Darth Vader in the Obi-Wan Kenobi series, while a combination of machine learning software and CGI would be used to de-age Harrison Ford for Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, Nicolas Cage and Helen Slater for The Flash, and in the very same movie, resurrect the likeness of Christopher Reeve, dead for 19 years for a one-scene cameo. In all this time, open access generative AI software and awareness of that software has grown exponentially, 
with AI-based content creators, videos, songs, memes, Twitch streams, articles, and just about everything in between. Culminating in 2023 with an alleged proposal by the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers to the Striking Screen Actors Guild to use AI technology to digitally scan the image and likeness of background actors for infinite reuse in any future studio project at the smacking good deal of one day's on-set pay. If every ethical concern ever spawned from the rise of digital faces had no validity before, it most certainly did now. Because the once irrational fears from the age of computers have somehow come full circle. It really is a digital Jurassic Park, where innovations not in biological science, but computer science, have nurtured a cinematic theme park not for dead dinosaurs, but for dead actors. And though Jurassic Park could never be responsible for the conquest of AI or the trajectory of its tech decades later, it is technically responsible for digital faces. While the single most revolutionary shot in Jurassic Park does contain a dinosaur, that dinosaur doesn't make it revolutionary. This does. The first digital face swap in film, replacing the face of stunt actress Natalie Bollinger with Ariana Richards' face, thus introducing a now commonplace practice in the stunt industry. However disturbing Hollywood's infatuation with digital faces is today, entertainers have been somewhat obsessed with the technological impersonation of people for as far back as Walt. And in all this time, the line between right and wrong, between ethical and unethical impersonation, has never been drawn from anything more than spectacle. This is the intricate irony buried at the heart of all showmen and innovators, where the ambition to dazzle, left unchecked, fosters both the violation of the natural world and the god complex primed to violate. It is also at the heart of Jurassic Park, but unlike advocates for machine learning algorithms today, Crichton and Spielberg made no secret of its perversion then. And who better than Crichton's stand-in character? the rock star nerd Ian Malcolm to lay out this perversion for all to see. See the lack of humility before nature that's being displayed here in um, Staggers. Welcome to Jurassic Park. While neither Grant nor paleobotanist Ellie Sattler are ever fully disarmed by Hammond's prehistoric utopia, as they slowly pick fault after fault in the park's automation, haphazard installation of poisonous fauna, and over-aggressive raptors, it's chaos theorist Ian Malcolm who identifies the carnal sin in Hammond's over-ambition. His scientists were, of course, so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should, but moreover, the technology Hammond wields didn't require any discipline to attain. You know, you read what others had done, and you, and you took the next step. You didn't earn the knowledge for yourselves, so you don't take any responsibility for it. You stood on the shoulders of geniuses uh, to accomplish something as fast as you could, and before you even knew what you had, you, you patented it, and packaged it, and slapped it on a plastic lunchbox, and now you're selling it. You want to sell it. Well, of course, Malcolm is right. Malcolm is right in more ways than he's aware, because the back end of Jurassic Park is as riddled with ethical neglect as its central attractions. Hammond's all-important IT department, tasked with running the park's automation and security, is understaffed and underpaid. Without the expertise of Wayne Knight's Dennis Nedry, the park literally cannot operate. No one is as qualified as him, yet he couldn't feel more undervalued. I will not get drawn into another financial debate with you, Dennis. I really will not. There's hardly any debate at all. Despite every possible expense, Jurassic Park was seemingly built from everything but accountability. And unfortunately, it comes at a cost that everyone else pays first. By now, the deficient pay of union writers and actors prior to their respective strikes against the AMPTP has been well documented. 
but far less exposed, at least until the last couple years, is the exploitation of a group without a union and with little hope of forming one. The visual effects industry. Those wizards of awesome spectacle, at the mercy of effects-dominated franchises and the studios who own them. Last year, an anonymous testimony from a VFX artist for Marvel cited 64-hour work weeks, tight turnarounds on last-minute changes to the entire third act of their film, and co-workers who broke down crying or suffered anxiety attacks at work. In a poll issued out earlier this year to a subset of VFX workers, 70% reported having worked uncompensated overtime hours, and 75% reported working through legally mandated rest periods without compensation and asked whether or not they felt that the current VFX industry was sustainable in the long term, 68% said no. This level of crunch was nowhere near as prominent in the business of special effects in the 90s, but the attitudes perpetuating that degree of it? Crichton thought so. For as much of a proponent for innovative technology as Crichton was in his films, he was, and always was, a much bigger opponent of its misuse, of Walt Disney-esque figures and the self-destructive ends to their mortal pursuit of godhood. Whether it was Westworld or now Jurassic Park, he saw the same grift, the kind of blind, money-hungry administrator fraught in a spectacle-driven industry. But in Spielberg's adaptation, Hammond's transformation once again adds a new and even more disturbing layer. That even those with the purest of intentions could be inadvertently complicit in exploitative practices. Even him. The advent of the blockbuster he co-opted was thrilling for audiences, but also gave major studios the ideal model for generating sky-high profits. And by the time of Jurassic Park, Spielberg was staring down the barrel of the innovation that would change his industry and solidify the dominance of the studio blockbuster, that ever-sharpening thorn in the side of both the film medium and the artists who serve it, potentially forever. Spielberg was John Hammond, and there was no more running from it. And so, he made a choice. He honed all his ability, all the might and magic of his crew's living, breathing dinosaurs into a shocking, terrifying thing with teeth, clamping down on the inner child of young and old alike with the single most important warning ever filmed against the dangers of playing God. Utilizing Winston's all but living animatronic monsters, Spielberg and director of photography Dean Cundey hold the camera close on the genuine dread of Sam Neill, Jeff Goldblum, Ariana Richards, and Joseph Mazzello. Editor Michael Kahn cuts at the seeming height of tension in every shot, communicating through wides of Murin and Island CGI T-Rex the hopeless distance between child and guardian. <laughs> In every movement, every flick of its eye, Spielberg wields the T-Rex for the ungovernable technology it represents, as if the animatronic itself cannot be controlled, nor the CGI be tamed. It should dispel all doubts that Hammond, or anyone with the power to truly change the world, could ever have control, and it should scare you. Jurassic Park at first makes this clear in one very disarming sequence, but then does it over and over and over again. Oh, Mr. Arnold. <laughs> Hammond's dinosaurs are not inherently evil any more than the effects behind them are, but the behavior they have been engineered with is a direct consequence of Hammond's erroneous god complex. And the same can surely be said of the worst digital creatures left to roam the Jurassic Park of today. 
through recent advancements in generative AI, AI researchers have unlocked the power to create original artwork. Many of these works are beautiful, and some have even won awards, such as Jason Allen's Theater Diopera Spatial, which won first prize in digital art at the Colorado State Fair in 2022. But the massive, underlying problem with Allen's art, and nearly all AI-generated art created through popular programs Midjourney, Dolly 2, and Stable Diffusion, is that they rely on the work of other human artists in their training data, usually acquired without the consent of said artists, producing, at times, near-blatant ripoffs of other artists' art styles and artwork. This includes the massively popular AI-generated profile pictures created through ProfilePicture.ai that swept through social media, AI-generated assets used in video games like This Girl Does Not Exist from developer CutePen Games, AI-generated stock images sold by Adobe on their website, and the opening credits to Marvel Studios' Secret Invasion, created by Method Studios using a custom AI tool of which series director Ali Salim confessed he doesn't really understand how it works. All are complicit in a disturbing yet unregulated form of digital theft. Oh, oh. From the endless stream of photos and videos scraped from social media and search engines, AI users have been able to generate depictions of real people and entirely fabricated scenarios with photorealistic quality. These span from harmless, albeit artistically indeliberate spoofs of what if Wes Anderson directed this, to manipulative illustrations used in political ads across the world. A downtown street littered with homeless people and a commercial by Toronto mayoral candidate Anthony Fury a rendering of fake robbers in a jewelry shop by New Zealand's National Party, and a video by the United States' Republican National Committee envisioning artificial doomsday scenarios. Even if none of these pictures are totally convincing on their own, it is not naive to presume that they could one day be so indiscernible from real photos, you won't know the difference. In other examples, generative AI was used to create a song featuring Drake and The Weeknd that accumulated almost 1 million listens across Spotify and YouTube before it was taken down. Voice actors like Jennifer Hale and Steve Bloom have spoken out after finding AI-generated copies of their voices on AI sites and in inflammatory harassment campaigns. But the most infamous AI technology on the market? The Velociraptor of all AI could only be OpenAI's ChatGPT, a large language model chatbot trained on books, articles, and massive amounts of data from Reddit threads, tweets, and social media interactions to mimic human responses. It is eerily human-like in its messages and actively learns from user feedback. Since its introduction, ChatGPT has been used to write code, school essays, and even aced a bar exam in March 2023. It surely has its uses, but left unthwarted, it will eventually be used to replace writers in all creative industries. On its heels, several other companies and countries, including China, have raced to create their own competing chatbot, from Google's Bard, Binu's Ernie, and Anthropic's Claude. None have stacked up to ChatGPT's capabilities, but their accelerating development has done very little to ease the widespread fear that the world's first superintelligence may be right around the corner. At the height of both a scramble from schools to either develop AI detection software or pivot away from the online censure curriculum brought about by the pandemic, and strikes by the WGA and SAG after a guild to protect their industry from the proliferation of AI, OpenAI CEO Sam Altman joined over 300 other industry leaders and AI experts in signing a letter by the Center for AI Safety in May warning that humankind will go extinct if no comprehensive law regulating AI usage are passed, effectively condemning the widespread misuse of his own technology and all the AI tools just like it. Since before then, Altman has met with hundreds of lawmakers across the world in the hopes of regulating AI usage before it's too late. 
At the same time, OpenAI's sudden ousting then rehiring of Altman with a new board in November suggests a turn away from the concerns over AI ethics the nonprofit board was founded for towards a nebulous, profit-driven vision for AI development. And all the while, proponents for haphazard AI programs still loom large. In 2020, Warner Brothers signed a deal to employ an AI-driven project management system that uses statistical data to determine what films should be greenlit. Netflix has recently been training a machine learning algorithm with hundreds of thousands of hours of film and TV to do match cuts. Gamers, a company I used to work for, fired 40% of its workforce in March, then put out a listing for an AI editor in July. Sports Illustrated was caught crediting an AI-generated author and allegedly publishing several AI-generated articles. And AI enthusiasts are spreading the fucked up gospel of a future where entire TV episodes or movies could be AI generated. You could use AI to continue to generate more episodes, another sequel, and then there is a world where eventually maybe we get home from work and we say, I'm in the mood for a rom-com, I've gotten my heart broken or whatever it is, and AI generates something for you. <laughs> No matter their prevalence, their convenience, or their false promise against their very evident harm, the biting truth of these technologies is as universal as the truth in Hammond's dinosaurs. They exist and achieve perpetuity not because they dazzle, not anymore. They persist for the demands of industry. To be created and then sold, regardless of the consequences to cut costs on real workers, valuable time, and maybe even more dazzling effects. With enough support, the ever skyrocketing cost of the blockbuster would shrink, while profits soar. More billion dollar grossing Jurassic World sequels could be made on a dime, and if they underperform, it's no problem. The risk was low from the get. Is Top Gun Maverick seeing a rise in engagement? An AI will generate an entire Top Gun series for half of Maverick's cost. Are audiences craving a younger Jennifer Aniston to become the next Marvel hero? It could be done in a snap. Did it not go over well? No problem. Now they're played by an unknown, scanned from a one-day shoot. The agency and soul inherent in art made by human hands will diminish, but it won't matter. It will already be too late to do anything about it. Too late to recover what was stolen by all-powerful corporations, too late to solve the absolution of a fast-fading art form, and too late to prevent the imminent digital doomsday. Too late to turn back to yesterday. Well, it came about when my daughters were very young, and I, Saturday was always uh, Daddy's Day with the two daughters. So we'd start out and try to go someplace with, you know, different things, and I take them to the merry-go-round and I took them different places and as I'd sit there while they uh, they rode the merry-go-round did all these things I'd sit on a bench you know eating peanuts I felt that there should be something built some kind of a, an amusement enterprise built where that the parents and the children could uh, have fun together I started with many ideas threw them away started all over again and eventually it evolved into what you see today as Disneyland. But it all started from a daddy with two daughters wondering where he could take them, where he could have a little fun with them too. On the other side of Spielberg's Jurassic Park, there is one more truth, far less biting than the rest. Industry and avarice may doom all innovation. Unchecked ambition may be complicit in that doom. But none of this turmoil might arise if not for one unquenching need to never grow up. We 
experience wonder as children. Find joy playing with our dinosaurs and don't think twice about tomorrow. And then we get older. Life rips off the band-aid and everything that once made us smile loses its luster. Loss, in every sense of the word, borrows a deep, dark hole within us and we spend our adult lives filling it with anything and everything we can. Money, fame, power, and nostalgia. We play our childhoods on repeat, even when they're dead and gone. We build machines to live in other worlds, even when it neglects our own. And we do all of it in the vain search for that brief, passing moment where we don't just see, we believe. You know the first attraction I ever built when I came down from Scotland? It's a flea circus, Petticoat Lane. We had uh, a wee trapeze and a car carousel. They all move, motorised of course, but uh, people would say they could see the fleas. Oh, I can see the fleas, mummy, can't you see the fleas? This place I wanted to show them something that wasn't an illusion. Something that was real. We both support and are happily subdued by an ecosystem of spectacle that turns our longing for childhood into massive corporate profits. But it's also this very system, and the elites who run it, that are responsible for the mass exploitation of humans who work tirelessly to achieve our awe. Resistance feels ineffectual. Spreading awareness, like asking for an argument. Researching a product for ethical consumption, like offloading the responsibility onto the consumer, when it really should be the other way around. The days when we could naively enter the gates of our favorite stories drift ever more into the rear view, and we're left asking, when will the day come that we can finally return? The solution is not in the contraptions we invent, the make-believe we engineer from pixels, and not the faces we raise from the dead. It's so much simpler, and we've known it from the start. It's just… people. More powerful than any animatronic, more awesome than any dinosaur and more valuable than any innovation, the magic of people. It should go without saying, but the complete lack of regard for the people that have and will be impacted by the integration of AI begs a reminder. AI will, admittedly, have a genuinely positive impact on parts of society, and there is evidence to prove it. From AI helpers in hospitals, FDA-approved algorithmic AI for detecting symptoms of lung or breast cancer, safer car manufacturing in AI-assisted assembly lines, and AI-powered farms. It is nonetheless all the more paramount that the application of AI technology not be embraced in industries where it has been posed not as a tool, but as a replacement. Do you think that those making artificial intelligence are so preoccupied with whether they could, they're not stopping to think whether they should. I don't think it's about morality. It's just about climbing a mountain and getting to the top and then looking back down to, 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 to ask the question, is this going to better serve the, hum the you know, you know, you know, humanity or is this going to default to what I created? The soul is, 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 is unimaginable and it's ineffable, the soul, and it cannot be created by any algorithm. The human touch must be preserved, and there is hope that it can. Programs like Glaze are being developed to trick deep learning models by feeding them inaccurate data. Lawmakers are beginning to evaluate safeguards for future AI usage, such as the EU's AI Act or an executive order to protect American jobs from AI replacement. And of course, the deals that the WGA and SAG after a union secured in their months-long strikes provide ample protections from AI replacement. But crucially, their contracts will expire again in three years. And even more crucially, IATSE's current contract will expire next summer, where AI will absolutely still be a hot-button issue. 
The genie is not going back in the bottle, but that doesn't mean it has to lead us to extinction. Despite the art forms it has. On the eve of the digital revolution, Jurassic Park was already responsible for retiring the stop motion medium from its prominence in special effects. In fact, it was Phil Tippett, realizing that his stop motion dinosaurs would soon be replaced by CGI, who coined the line, We're out of a job. Don't you mean extinct? While Tippett's animatics would serve as a reference for ILM CG artists, Tippett saw no other use for his talents at ILM. But then Spielberg did something for Tippett he frankly didn't have to. He asked him to help ILM's animators figure out the movements of the dinosaurs. Tippett invented the DID, the Dinosaur Input Device, and tracked all the movements of the dinosaurs before the digital painters gave them their photorealistic look. And then Spielberg invited him out to set to help direct shots and position the camera during dinosaur sequences. Tippett was credited as the dinosaur supervisor in the final film an ironic title for a movie where the dinosaurs break out, and graduated to a new role as a visual effects supervisor, albeit for a brief few years, before largely retiring and returning 30 years later with an absolutely insane stop motion movie called Mad God. Seriously, it's awesome. 30 years later, Tippett's work, along with the work of all the stop motion animators and puppeteers like him, has become immensely valuable understanding the importance of weight and texture in a way that has been tragically forgotten by time. Spielberg never had to elevate Tippett the way he did, but in doing so, he achieved a level of believability in Jurassic Park that was impossible without him. He couldn't resuscitate the stop motion medium, but he could be accountable, at least a little bit, for what his movie was about to do to it. He could, perhaps, hope for a future where stop motion wouldn't fade into oblivion, but evolve into something new. Maybe Tippett would find a place in the new Jurassic Park of visual effects. Most likely, he wouldn't. Spielberg's faith in the people behind his spectacle would never dwindle nonetheless. And against all our concerns, dread, and peril, maybe ours shouldn't either. After years of fear, fears of a blacklist for uncooperative VFX houses, and fears of outsourcing to studios in countries with anti-union laws, the tide might finally be turning in favor of VFX artists. This past summer, with the help of IHC, the first ever VFX union was formed from Marvel's 50-person in-house VFX studio. It's only a start, and doesn't yet include the thousands of other third-party VFX workers hired by Marvel year-round for their mountain of projects, but it's the most progress made in a decade, and may lead to a slow, gradual shift in the power dynamic between VFX houses and larger studios. 30 years on from Jurassic Park, it's a welcome sight, and it feels right. After careful consideration, I've decided not to endorse your park. So have I. There is always a choice on the path to innovation, a line to be drawn between healthy progress and misguided ambition. The debate over which is which, over ethical or unethical impersonation, is nothing less than a messy, winding road of wireframes, code, and algorithms. Evidently, it's never been an easy choice either. But through it all, the people we love must always come first. Jurassic Park can wait.
Hello! Welcome to the end of the video. Man, it's so good to have you here. Uh, congratulations on watching the whole thing, and uh, thank you for watching the whole thing. I really appreciate it. And uh, a special thank you to all of my supporters on Patreon for supporting the making of this video over the last several months. Uh, even amid the months that there wasn't a whole lot of communication from me, which is something that I will uh, take greater strides going forward to uh, not do again. Uh, so thank you all so very much. Artificial intelligence, uh, needless to say, is a very thorny topic. Uh, there's big news on it pretty much every day. Uh, I mean, there were things that were last minute additions to this video that kind of had to be last minute additions that I couldn't skip because the news cycle in artificial intelligence is so rapid. Um, after watching this video, I'll probably get some comments below calling me a Luddite. Uh, some people will probably call me overdramatic. Uh, there'll probably be some comments saying that I'm not being dramatic enough and that artificial intelligence is a threat to us all. Uh, wherever you stand, um, if you'd like to educate yourself further, or if you're a skeptic of anything that I brought up in this video, uh, you can go in the description below, and I have a Google Doc linked to all of my research for this video, so you can educate yourself through all the same sources that I learned about artificial intelligence through, um, as well as everything that I brought up about the visual effects industry, about Jurassic Park, about Westworld, Michael Crichton, Walt Disney, all of it's there. Uh, uh, and as an organized a manner as possible. Whatever the future holds for artificial intelligence, as I said in the video, it's not something that's gonna go away. So, uh, you know, support the right people, the right causes, uh, call your lawmakers, advocate for AI safety laws, all that sort of stuff. It's very important stuff. Viewers, I apologize for how long this video took, like extraordinarily long. It is a complicated video, but I've had a crazy year. Uh, so this video, unfortunately, was something that kept getting delayed throughout the last few months in order to get completed, but uh, hopefully it all paid off for you. And as well, uh, I am already working on the next video. And moreover, I will be announcing what that next video is one week from today. So on December 20th, uh, just a couple days before Christmas, um, I will be uploading a video here on the channel to announce what that next video is. A little bit of a hint, it is something that a lot of you ask me to talk about this year, well, here's me finally getting around to it. Speaking of Christmas, this Christmas Eve, as I've done for the last 10 years on Twitch, I will be doing a Christmas Eve charity live stream where I play an entire game from start to finish, or as much of a game as I can tolerate, while raising money for charity. Uh, though I haven't decided on what charity I will be supporting this year and raising money for, uh, we are going to be playing through Spider-Man 2, and we're gonna try and beat the story from start to finish on hardest difficulty. Should be lots of fun. And as I've said, this is the 10th year that we're doing this, so kind of a big deal for me, and uh, it would really mean a lot if you tuned in, showed up, even for just a little bit of time, and heck, if you were able, uh, donated some to the charity that we end up on. Um, I've been slowly sort of upgrading the Twitch channel and sort of my streaming setup uh, all year, even though I haven't really done... <laughs> many streams at all um but yeah i've been preparing for this and uh it's going to be a big one so i'll have more details to share about that in regards to the charity and what time exactly i'll be going live very soon but for that you should follow me on twitch at twitch.tv forward slash scitor you can follow me on instagram and twitter at parks Harmon. and as always you can also support me on patreon all the support is so appreciated all right that's all i gotta say so uh thank you all for watching and see you in the next one yeah.